Good morning. David is under the weather this morning, so you're stuck with me. Sorry. Um, I just want to go ahead and welcome everybody. Thank you. If you're visiting from uh, visiting with us, please come back again and hear our preacher because he is awesome and really good at what he does. And so I'm just going to try and, and try and fill in this morning. We're actually going to talk about a little bit about what we've been talking about in the teen class uh, over the last two weeks. We, uh, like I said, David's kind of sick, so not a lot of pre-warning. So I kind of put this together, and, and I thought that it would be beneficial to everybody this morning just to kind of go over these two lessons that we've had. And we have two main scriptures that we're going to look at from our last two lessons that I think uh, maybe we can get some insight from. And the first story, uh, this, whole, this whole series is based on a book that's called Follow Me. And the first chapter and the first lesson that we did is called The Call. And so, uh, if you will, we're go- I want you to picture with me, picture with me, okay, picture with me four fishermen. Four fishermen standing by the sea, and Jesus approaches them and he says, follow me. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And with these words, Jesus changed everything about these men's lives. With these words, he changed their entire lives. Their family, their safety, their possessions were taken away. And repeatedly after this, he would say, if anyone's going to follow me, he must deny himself. Over and over again, he would say this. In a world that we live in, still today, where the world is always telling us to look out for yourself, the world revolves around self and, and making sure that you're, that you're preserve and protect and promote yourself, take care of yourself. Jesus came to these four men and he said, slay yourself. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And we know that these four men, this wasn't just some rosy picture. They actually ended up following Jesus and they actually ended up paying a pretty steep price for it. Peter was, uh, according to tradition, Peter was hung upside down on a cross and killed Andrew was crucified in Greece, James was beheaded, and John was exiled to an, I- to an island. These guys followed Jesus, and their life was drastically changed. And from that point on, nothing was the same for them. They left their whole lives behind, and it ended up at the end of their lives, they made the ultimate sacrifice. Their lives were totally, totally altered. But they believed that following Jesus was worth that cost. These four men that Jesus called here by the sea believed that it was worth the cross. 2,000 years later, how far from that are we? 2,000 years later, uh, somewhere along the way and amid varying cultures and, and different popular church trends, it seems that we have minimized following Christ. It seems somewhere along the way we kind of lost this idea of total abandonment to follow Jesus. Churches are filled all across the nation with, with people who claim to be Christians who are living life like this, living out their Christian life with yawns. And part of it is because scores of people have been told that being a Christian simply means believing a certain thing, or it means you know, saying a certain prayer, or it means just getting up and going underwater and and then you're done. This is what people have been told. And it leads to a life, it leads to a to a church where people come and and yawn and and go to sleep. There's more to Jesus, more to a life of following Jesus than just routine routine religion. There's more to a life of following Jesus than than just that. If you will, open up to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. We read this once already this morning. We're going to read it again. Matthew chapter 4. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. In the boat was Zebedee, their father, 
mending their nets. And he called to them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. In this one scene, we find that, that when Jesus calls these four guys, it's not just, li- just a simple thing like, hey guys, I want to show you something. Come follow me real quick. This is actually a plea to say, hey guys, give up your whole lives and come follow me. It was like this huge question that Jesus is asking, and they actually end up doing it. And, uh, and when we did this in class, I asked the kids to think of some things that like, they physically had to give up. We talked about their boat their house, their family, their money, their safety net, their literal nets. Um, all these things that they had to give up. And, and we talked about how their boats are kind of like their profession, their livelihood, their nets, are their security, their money, the things that they have leaned on their whole lives. Their family is this love and this security. They gave up all of that to go and to follow Jesus. And not only did they leave everything this, behind when they decided to follow Jesus, Life as they knew it was never the same for them again. When they met Jesus, when they decided to follow him, their life was changed forever. What's changed in the last 2,000 years since Christ called these first disciples? Does Jesus still call us to lose everything like these guys did to follow him? Think about Christians today. Is it possible that we've begun to settle for routine religion rather than actually living to follow Christ? What excuses, what excuses do Christians today often make to keep, to keep us from leaving everything behind and following Jesus? How many times have we heard this? The plan of salvation. Hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. We hear it all the time, and we usually get really, really focused on that last word there, and be baptized. You know, we get, hopefully, you know, you're reading your Bible, you're telling people about Christ, and you get, you get into a Bible study, and you're like, you've heard now, if you believe, then you repent, and you confess, then we can baptize you right now. And that's awesome. That's great. That's where we meet Jesus in the water of baptism. But a lot of times, we get so focused in on getting people into the water Now, we miss that third word up there. That third word is repent. And I think as we're listing these off on our fingers, a lot of times we need to take a little more time to focus on on that word repent. What does that word mean? According to the Holman Illustrated Bible Dictionary, uh, repentance occurs when a radical turning to God takes place, an experience in which God is recognized as the most important fact of one's existence. Think about the moment you became a Christian. Think about that that time when you were baptized. Did God become the most important fact of your existence? These four men, when they left their livelihood, when they left everything behind to follow Jesus, he became the most important thing in their existence. They left everything in order to follow Christ. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, Jesus begins his ministry on earth by proclaiming, Repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. The word repent means that we see our sins, we see how our life has been going this way in one direction. We've been moving this way towards the world. This is what we've been focusing on. And that day we decide to turn around and totally focus on moving towards Christ and moving towards him. Repentance is this rich biblical term that signifies an elemental transformation in someone's mind, heart, and their life. When people repent, they turn away from walking one direction and start walking another. Did we have true repentance when we met Jesus? When these guys met Jesus, they had a total life-changing experience. Do we have that? The moment we went into the water and we met Jesus there and his death and came up again a new creature, did we actually become a new creature? Did we actually repent and change our life for him? Which leads me to my second point from our second class, be transformed. All right, so if I showed up, say we've got lunch. Me and you have lunch plans, all of you individually. Um, Say we've got lunch plans, and I come in late, and I'm like out of breath, and I'm like, 
Mr. Eddie, I'm sorry I was late. I was on my way here, and I got a, I got a flat tire. I got out of my car. I started to change it, and, and I decided I, you know, I needed something. I walked out into the road, and I got hit by a Mack truck. You might look at me like this guy. Like, what? <laughs> the moment, if you get hit by a Mack truck, Malvin, you didn't get up and, like, brush yourself off and come to lunch, you know? If you get hit by a Mack truck, you are going to be drastically changed. When we meet Jesus, we're supposed to be drastically changed. When we have that moment of meeting Jesus, it's supposed to be like a Mack truck hitting us. Where we, when we go into work the next day, it's not just like, hey guys, guess what happened yesterday? It's a drastic change where everyone we meet goes, wow, something has changed. That guy's living differently than he was before. The things in his life aren't important to him anymore. He's been hit by Jesus. His life has been changed. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. If you want to open up there, we're going to read that. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. Here Jesus is talking and he says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. A couple of truths that we can get from this passage. Uh, we, we talked about this, this verse in our teenage class, and uh, we kind of had to like walk through you know, what grapes are and how the whole thing works. So in the picture here, you can see these are grapes. Um, if you ever have bought grapes at your house uh, from the grocery store, they come in a plastic bag, uh, and they are usually attached to this little stick tree-looking thing. Um, and then the grapes are on the end. You eat all the grapes, and then you've still got the little stick, and you throw it away, right? Everybody had grapes before? Okay. Um, actually... This may come as a surprise to some, some of our younger millennial and younger age people. Um, grapes don't grow at the grocery store. They grow on a vine in a vineyard. And there's this, there are big vines that are connected and they stay there and they grow off branches. And the branches is that little stick thing that you get to take home and put in your, gro- in your refrigerator. And so in this imagery that Jesus is making here, he's saying that he's that big vine. He's the big vine that the branches are growing off of. And we, as his followers, as his disciples, are those little branches. And what do branches do? They produce the grapes. They produce the fruit. And he says that as long as you're connected to me, as long as your branch is connected to the vine here, you're going to produce fruit. But what happens the moment that somebody cuts that branch off from the vine. It's not going to produce any more fruit. When you eat all the grapes off of your little stick at home, no more grapes are going to grow on that stick. That's why you throw it away. The only way it grows fruit is if it's connected to the vine. And Jesus says that in the same way that you are connected to me, I am connected to my Father. The same way that you are in me, I am in my Father. And he says basically that we are One, just like he is with God, with him, if we're connected. And because of that, we produce fruit. That's the imagery that he's giving here. And a couple of truths that we can get to that, get from that, is that as disciples in Christ, we are united with Christ. As disciples of Christ, we are united in him. Number two, when we confess Jesus as our Lord, he changes everything in our life. He changes us to bear fruit. And number three, as we abide in his word, 
we will, we will bear fruit in this world. John chapter 15, verse 10 says, If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's command and remain in his love. We connect to the vine. The way we stay in Jesus is through his word. We read his word, we connect to him, and when we connect to him, our life is changed and we produce fruit. That's just how it goes. If we're not producing fruit, we may want to check our connection with Christ. Because the imagery that Jesus gives here is if you're a healthy branch that is connected to the vine, you will produce fruit. Do we really believe the Word of God? Do we really believe Jesus' call? When we are gladly and gladly willing to lose our lives, to know and proclaim Christ, we have answered the call to follow Jesus. I think a lot of times we get stuck in a world where we have to work every day, we have to deal with our families, we have to deal with our coworkers, we have to deal with temptation in our lives, and it's so easy to say, all right, here we go, it's Sunday morning, get dressed, come to church, la, 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 let's go to Poncho's, you know, our normal Sunday thing, and totally forget that we're actually following Christ. And when it says, lose our lives to proclaim and know Christ, it's not talking about just that hypothetical that, you know, we used to talk about when I was, in, when I was a teenager, people always used to talk about this and say, you know, if somebody held a gun to your head and said, are you a Christian? Would you say yes? If they said, I'm going to kill you if you tell me that you're a Christian and put a gun to your head, would you say yes? I hope we would all say yes in that situation. And that can be a very powerful thing to think about, to literally lose your life for it. But what Christ is talking about here isn't just that final moment, that do or die situation. He's talking about every single day, losing your daily life, losing the things in your life that are most important to you outside of God. Are you willing to? to lose everything to follow Christ. When we are, we do those things that I put up on the board a minute ago. We've we've heard, we believe, we confess, and then we repent. We turn towards Christ. We start following him. Our entire life is changed as we get baptized and we meet Christ there. And it's like getting hit by a Mack truck and our whole life is totally changed. And we are now just disciples of Christ. And disciples go out, and since everyone can tell that we're so different, that our whole life has been changed, we start to produce fruit, which means our, we start to produce the fruits of the Spirit, and we start to produce other disciples. Because they see our changed life, they see our joy, our hope, and they want a piece of it. So this morning, I just want to ask, are we following Christ? Not just have you been baptized, have you been saved? Because if you haven't, we invite you to do that this morning too. Meet Jesus for the first time. Go into the water and become a Christian. But if you haven't, if you have done that, and somewhere along the way you fell asleep in your life, you fell asleep in church, you fell asleep following Jesus, we ask that you come forward today, this morning too. We're here for you to pray for you. If you would, please come as we stand and sing. Of you, one thing that we desire that as we worship you, Lord, come and change our lives.